Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. This song I'm going to share, um, it talks how Jesus died of a broken heart. And he did it for each and every one of us. But um, by his stripes, we are healed. So you got your heart broken too. And you hurt so bad you don't know what to do. And you think that you are the only one who's ever felt this way. But there was sure another one, another day. Died of a broken heart, it broke for you and me. He loved us more than words could say, and more than we could see. His death was not from the pain he felt while hanging on the tree. No, he died of a broken heart for you and me. And it seems you've come to the end. And you're standing all alone without a friend. Sure that no one's ever heard this bad before, but there was one who heard this bad and even more, and he died of a broken heart. It broke. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful reminder. He died of a broken heart. When our hearts are broken for him, we can live. 
a beautiful promise. It is great to be back in the beautiful community of Coquille, Oregon, and even better to be in God's house on the Sabbath with God's people and here with the family of God. I think the last time I was here, it's been a while, um, was doing evangelism training. Pastor Bryce was here then doing an evangelistic series. And so that's been a while, and it's good to be back. And I'm glad to see that you're taking part in the, uh, the Great Reset um, uh, evangelistic series. And as Pastor Herb, Herb said, it's good for church members, too, to go through it. The saying goes like this. What made you an Adventist will keep you an Adventist. And it's good to hear those testing truths again. So I'm glad to see that uh, you're doing that. Our scripture this morning, Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. You know, the gospel is found in the book of Revelation. We think of it as a book of prophecy, which it is. But it's also, it's the revealing of Jesus Christ. That's what revelation means, is that through this book, through these writings, we get to know Jesus better. And so this passage, Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7, says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true. We know this to be Jesus. Jesus is holy and true. Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. They're in red letters in my Bible. So I know that they're the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus who holds the key of David. What Jesus opens, no one can shut. And what Jesus shuts, no one can open. And then he says to us, I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for these words inspired by the Holy Spirit, these words authored by Jesus Christ himself. As we take time today to consider these words and what they mean for us, I pray that you will open our hearts to receive your scripture, that you may teach us through the author of this word, your sweet spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in college, I worked uh, as a student chaplain at Walla Walla General Hospital. I got that position my last couple years as a, as a student there in Walla Walla. And I developed this routine uh, to do my chaplain duties. When I would sh show up, I'd look through the list of you know, who would come in, who I need to visit. Uh, but the first thing I would do as I started my daily rounds, I'd go right to the maternity wing. Because there, I was always see happy patients. <laughs> I'd get to hold babies, I'd see happy parents and the, and the moms. It was a great way to, to begin my visits for the day. You know, the mothers didn't care if I was the chaplain or the janitor. You know, they just loved to get, to get visits. And it didn't matter if they were Christian, non-Christian, Muslim, Hindu. I mean, I saw them all there. They almost always allowed me to pray with them because new mothers love it when someone will pray for that new addition to their family. And so these visits then would set me in just the right frame of mind to go on to, to do some of the harder visits that I would have to make uh, doing my rounds. But one day, I was totally unprepared for what happened next. I left the maternity wing and I went to the first room on the medical floor. And I used my regular opening line. Hello, Helen. I'm Chuck McKean. I'm the chaplain on duty today, and I just came to see how you're doing. And Helen said, get out. Now, I'd never heard that before in my short time as a chaplain, and so I dug deep into my theological training to come up with a response, and I said, what? <laughs> and she said, you heard me. I said, get out. He said, I don't have the time of day for God. 
And I said, well, Helen, I'm not God. Will you talk to me instead? And she said, listen. She says, I'm 87 years old. I hurt all the time. I just want to die, but your God is keeping me alive to make me suffer. And so I asked her, well, Helen, isn't there something that you have to live for? And she kind of settled down a bit to tell me her story. She had lost all three of her children. You know, parents are not supposed to bury their kids, are they? Especially not supposed to bury all of their kids. She lost all three. Her husband had gotten sick recently, spent a lot of time in the hospital, ran up big medical bills, and then he passed away. Because of those medical bills and her other bills, she wasn't able to afford to pay those bills and pay her other bills and buy food to eat. So now she was suffering. And she was in pain. She was so, in so much pain that she couldn't take care of herself any longer. So they had just told her before I came in that they were going to have to send her to, her, uh, to a nursing home. She couldn't go home. She's going to have to go to a nursing home where they could care for her. She said, I just want to die. But your God is keeping me alive just to make me suffer, she said. And so then she looked at me and she asked me, so you tell me, chaplain, what do I have to live for? And as I listened to her story, you know, I, could, I could hear her sense, her attitude of, of hopelessness. And I had no quick, easy answer. I mean, you don't have pat answers for, for those kinds of things. I, you know, I, tried, I tried to tell her about Jesus. She didn't want to hear about Jesus. And I, the hospital chaplain, the straight A theology student at Walla Walla College could give her no good reason to hang on to her life. And it shook me. Because I thought, you know, if I can't give Helen a flicker of hope for her life, well, maybe I don't have it for myself. What if I was in her position? Would I feel any different? How, would I, how do I know that, that I would ha have something to hang on to if I was in her situation? And then I thought, well, how can I share something with other people that maybe I don't even have for myself? The next day was my day to visit the patients on the surgical floor. So I alternated. One day, medical floor. The next day, the surgical floor. And so I went and I visited the patients on the surgical floor, but I was still a bit shaken by that conversation that I'd had with Helen. But I put on my best face, and you go around, you do the work of a chaplain, and you know, do what you can to encourage people, cheer them up. I was about ready to call it a day. When I noticed there was a new patient, new patient on the surgical floor that I hadn't seen yet. I didn't, really didn't feel like visiting anyone else, but I thought, well, I better go in and see. Maybe, you know, maybe he's got a pastor that I can call for him to, to come and visit him. Dave was a young man in his mid-30s. Mid-30s is young, right? <laughs> he was a young man in his mid-30s. Dave had been out deer hunting a couple of days earlier up in the Blue Mountains outside of Walla Walla there. Now, he was driving alone. He was out hunting alone, driving in his pickup truck. And it was starting to get, you know, head toward dusk and starting to get a little bit dark. So he decided I better head out. But uh, he stopped one last time to take a look. And sure enough, he spotted a buck. So he shut off the truck, opened the door slowly, stepped out onto the running board. And then he reached over to grab his rifle, and he's sliding his rifle across the seat when the trigger caught on the seatbelt buckle. The blast shattered his left knee, threw him off of the truck down about a 10-foot embankment. So he's down there. His left leg is useless, but somehow he managed to pull himself back up that embankment and get into the truck. Somehow. He was able to drive that truck, a four-speed with a clutch, 
down this one, this old bumpy road with one leg. He drove eight miles down this road until he came to a gate. Now the gate was closed. And he said, my last thought was, I can't get out and open it, but maybe I can ease up to the truck to the gate and maybe I can push the gate open with the truck. And so he edged the truck up to the gate and that's when he discovered the gate was supposed to open towards him. <laughs> and so he's just pushing it closed rather than open. And that's when he passed out. Do you ever come across closed doors in your life? <laughs> you know, our scripture says that Jesus is the one who opens doors, but he also closes doors. And sometimes when we come up to those closed doors, it's a good thing. <laughs> if Jesus is the one who's closed the door. And in Dave's case, well, he should have died in that truck. Um, the only reason that he lived is because just as he passed out, a series of miracles began happening that wouldn't have happened if that gate was open and he had just rolled right on through there. But what happened was, he was up against that gate. He couldn't push it open. He passed out. When he passed out, his head fell forward on the horn. Now, a couple of miles away, there was uh, another pickup with two hunters in it, and they were heading out too, and, and, uh, but they thought, okay, let's take one last look for deer. And so they shut off the pickup and stepped out, and that's when they heard the horn. And they realize this thing is just, this horn is just going continually. Somebody's in trouble. And so they kind of listen to figure out, okay, it's coming up from this way. And so they drive a little bit and get out and, and listen again and, and try and make their way to where the sound of the horn was coming from until they finally found Dave. When they found him, they'd seen, oh man, this is a mess. They put a tourniquet on his leg to stop the bleeding. And then they called the Forest Service station on, at a CB radio. They called the Forest Service station, and the Forest Service ranger in turn called the Lifeguard Helicopter Ambulance. That helicopter was there in seven minutes. They got there, and the paramedics saw the situation. They looked at Dave. They saw his condition. They told the hunters, uh, we don't have much hope. I mean, he's lost a lot of blood. He said, we've never seen anyone lose that amount of blood and, and survive. They got him on the helicopter. He used every pint of plasma on the helicopter. On the way back to the, the hospital there, they, they got him there, got him into the emergency room that evening. The emergency room team fought all night to save Dave's life. You know, the beautiful thing about a Christian hospital is that all night long, all the staff, from the receptionist to the night janitor, everyone was praying for Dave. They didn't know who he was. They just knew there's some guy in, named Dave in the emergency room, and we've got to pray for him. So they were praying for him all night. They got him stabilized. They got him into some surgery to, to kind of get him more stabilized, and then they put him into the recovery room, and then he was there for, for quite a while, and then they brought him down to the surgical floor, and that's where I met him. And so he's telling me his story, and he's relating to me what they had told him, what they had heard from the helicopter uh, ambulance crew, and uh, then the doctor had talked to Dave about his situation, and so he told me, well, they've saved my life for now. <laughs> but the doctor was realistic. He said, the doctor told me, I'm not out of the woods yet. You know, an infection, he said, could still get me. Uh, the doctor said, you know, we can try an artificial knee, um, but you know, I really don't have a whole lot of hope um, because, you know, this leg looks pretty bad. We're probably going to end up needing to amputate it. Now, Dave was not a Christian. But another wonderful thing about a Christian hospital is there's a Bible in every room even in the recovery room. And there in the recovery room, as, as he was coming to, he, he found the Bible, and he started thumbing through it. And 
He says, I don't know anything about the Bible, he said, but I found a verse that is just for me. That's all mine. And he opened up to a bookmark in the back. I'm thinking, you know, for somebody who's opening the Bible for the first time, to go to the book of Revelation, <laughs> um, that you wouldn't think that that's where you know, they'd find a, a, a message, uh, but he did. He found this, he opened up to the book of Revelation, and then he read these words. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. Now, he doesn't know what the church in Philadelphia is. He thinks it's a church in Philadelphia that has this angel. <laughs> you know, so he says, man, this must be quite a church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. He read me that passage, and the first thing he says was, God knows my deeds, and my deeds are not very good. He's not been a Christian. He said, but it says this in verse 11. So he looks to verse 11, and it says, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He said, God has given me life. No one is going to take that away from me. No one is going to take my crown, he said. God has given me life. I'm going to use it for him. God has the keys of life, and he's given me an open door. And I thought, how ironic that it was a closed gate that saved his life. God has given me an open door, he said. He said, I don't know where it leads, but I'm going to go through it. And then it hit me. You know, Dave had plenty of reasons to give up. Um, there he was. He, he, he didn't have to have hope. He'd probably lose his leg. He'd probably, he could still die in the hospital. He'd probably never go back. He was a welder, and he says, I can't you know, do what I used to do as a welder now, so he's not going to go back to his job as a welder. At best, he's facing weeks in the hospital, months of, of rehabilitation, but he found a reason to live. God has keys. God had opened a door that no one can shut. When God opens a door, no one can shut it. When God shuts a door, no one can open it. And that's when it struck me, he didn't need me to give him a reason to live. He needed to know the one who has the keys, <laughs> has the keys of life, the keys to open doors, even in a hospital. So I had a quick prayer with Dave, <laughs> ran down to the medical floor. I had to see Helen. I thought, I, I, I've got, somehow Helen has to hear this story, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, well, I could go down there. Maybe they'll let me put Helen in a wheelchair and take her down and to talk to Dave because she won't listen to me, but she would listen to him. He's going through a devastating experience. She just needed to know that someone going through an experience like that can find hope in a God that's bigger than all of our problems, the most hopeless situation. When I got there, the housekeeping crew was cleaning out her room. She got her wish. She could see no reason to live. She didn't want to live. She wanted to die. She could see nothing good in life. She refused to hang on, and so she had passed away that morning. But, you know, it could easily have been the other way around. In my time there working at the hospital, I saw young and old alike who had given up. And I saw young and old alike who just showed this fiery determination to hang on and to live. The only difference between the two groups was in their line of sight. Because there's one group, like Helen, who looked at themselves 
and looked at the problems all around them and then looked back at themselves and they became discouraged. But then there was the other group like Dave who looked at God and then looked at the problems all around them. They looked back at God and they became encouraged because they saw power, they saw hope. And God showed them that he has the keys to open any door, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. You know, each one of us has an open door, right? And maybe some closed doors. But it's called God's plan for our life. We all have a plan. God has got a plan for each one of, of our lives. No one can close the door that he has opened, but we can refuse to go through it. We still have that power. We still have that control. So my question is, which group are you in? You know, maybe you feel like Helen sometimes. I think we all go through those experiences. When you feel like Helen, wouldn't you rather be a Dave <laughs> and have Dave's attitude? Well, I want to share with you some of the things that, that I picked up from Dave, that I learned from Dave there meeting with him for the next couple of weeks. I call them the, the keys of life that Dave taught me. The first key is this, to accept the fact that you cannot change the past. The past is done, it is what it is. You can't change it. Now, one of the reasons that Dave and I connected so well is that I used to be a welder. I'd been a welder before I went to college. I, I worked for Emerald Steel Fabricators in Eugene, Oregon. And there I was working one day, and I was picking up a half-ton steel beam with an overhead crane, and I'm lifting the thing up, and I got about this high when it slipped from the clamp and landed on my foot. Oh, how I wanted to turn back the clock. <laughs> Just a half a second, I could pull my foot out of the way. No, that didn't work. The beam is still laying there, and my foot is swelling up like a big old black and blue cantaloupe. I had to accept the fact that my foot was now hamburger. <laughs> There's nothing I could do about that past. Dave accepted the fact that his whole world changed in an instant. Nothing was going to be the same ever again. You know, the Apostle Paul had to deal with his past. This is what he writes in Philippians 3, beginning with verse 12. The Apostle says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Philippians 3, 12, he says, I'm moving forward. Verse 13, he says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what's behind and straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul was a man with the past. He persecuted God's people. He had a hand in the murder of Stephen. And yet Paul knew how to let go of it. He said, I forget that. Okay, I'm moving forward. There's some things, this is what I learned from Dave, you know, there's some things you can never change. You just have to move forward. All you can do is accept that it's in the past, that it happened, and get on with life. Dave could not put his knee back together, but he accepted it, and he began healing for the future. Helen couldn't put her family back together, and she never accepted that, and that past killed her. The second key that I learned from Dave then is to stop dwelling on the problem and start looking for solutions instead. So he didn't dwell on the fact that he would never go back to his welding job as it was. And so what he did was he began brainstorming, even there in the hospital, he began brainstorming, well, what can I do with this leg that's probably going to go away? What, what jobs can I do? Now, it doesn't mean that you ignore the problem. I can guarantee that I found out why that beam fell on my foot and it never happened again, <laughs> okay? So you don't ignore the problem, um, you deal with it. So there's two extremes. If you totally ignore 
the problems and the issues that you have in your life, you're doomed to repeat them. If you go too far the other way, if you focus all your attention on those problems, they'll kill you, just like they killed Helen. And so the balance is you identify the problem and then begin working on the solution, and then you can get the victory just like Dave did. You know, Scripture says this in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In that verse, you identify the problem. I confess my sin. I recognize, I admit to God, okay, this is an issue in my life. This is my problem. I acknowledge it. That's all Jesus wants to know is if you recognize that you've got a sin and then you give it to him and then he takes care of it. He's the solution. He forgives it and then he cleanses us from that. The third key that I learned from Dave is to accept yourself the way God sees you. So when God looks here in this sanctuary on Sabbath morning, what does he see? He sees a bunch of his children. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we, we should be called the children of God. Okay? Now, look at us. Either God has an incredible sense of humor or he has a lot of incredible love that he could love people like us. And Dave began to see himself for the first time as a child of the king with a crown of life on his head. And he determined no one's going to take that crown. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as, as your savior, you're a child of the king. You're a prince, you're a princess of the king of the universe. And the fourth key that I learned from Dave is this, the last key. Never limit yourself. Never limit yourself. You can do anything that God wants you to do. Now, you can do a whole bunch of things that God doesn't want you to do, but you're not going to like the results. But this is what it says in Christ Object Lessons, page 333. This is little, this little phrase that's so powerful where Ellen White says, all his biddings are enablings. In other words, whatever God calls you to do, he empowers you to do it. When he opens the door and says, come on through, he gives you everything you need to go through that door and to live your life according to his plan. Well, the last time I saw Dave, they were loading him back onto, they're getting ready to load him back onto the helicopter. <laughs> they're going to fly him over to uh, Seattle because that's where they could amputate his leg. That was the best place for him to go. And so as I visited with him that last time, he didn't talk about the accident. He'd accepted it. That's, that was in the past. That's done. He kept looking at the open door. He kept looking to the future. He saw this open door, and so he talked about his new life instead, what life was going to be like in his new reality. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior there in the hospital. You know a hospital can be church, <laughs> just like church is church. And that's where he found the Lord, was in the hospital. He knew that he's a child of God. He talked about the fact that, hey, I'm, I'm God's kid. And then he told me his dream for the future. He says, well, I may only have one leg. <laughs> Going forward, kind of joked about it. You know, not going to be a welder, not going to do that job anymore. He says, but somehow, he said, I'm going to use this experience to tell others about Jesus and the doors that he opens for us. Okay? I never saw Dave again after that, but I'll bet his vision became a reality. I bet it really did. So what's your vision for the future? What's the open door that, that God has placed in front of you? 
What are some of the closed doors? You can probably identify some things that, you know, that, you know, that door is closed. But if Jesus has closed it, then that's a good thing. You know, which way is God leading you? Never limit yourself. You know, sometimes we feel like Helen, don't we? But the good news is that we can have the attitude of Dave, <laughs> that we can look at God and we can see the open door. You know, if you're breathing, God has a plan for your life. <laughs> He's got an open door for you. Now, I, I, probably some closed doors. I don't know what it is. Maybe nobody else knows what it is, but I'll bet if you really think about it, you know what it is, whatever God's plan is for you. It might be a big plan. It might be a small plan. But the, the best thing about it is it's God's plan. He's the one who opens doors and no one can shut them. I'd like to close with this great hymn, number 537. He leadeth me, because he does if we'll let him. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 537.
precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can trust your leading. Lord, we don't know what's beyond the next step, let alone what's beyond today. But we know who we can trust. And your leading has led us this far, and we know that you'll continue to lead us into the future. Lord, we do grasp our hands in thine and ask you to take us where you would have us go, to remind us that all your biddings are enablings, that whatever you ask us to do, you will empower us to fulfill your will. Lord, I pray for this congregation as they move forward in the days ahead. May you bless them in their outreach efforts. May you bless the evangelistic series that's taking place. May you bless their uh, contacts in the community. And Lord, may you hear and answer their prayers for their loved ones today and every day. As we move through this Sabbath day, we thank you for your presence in our hearts and our lives. May you bring us into heavenly places during these holy hours, we pray in Jesus' name.